They're in a critical state right now or could be in 20 years. That was said in 1992, so over 20 years ago. And they set the levels at something we thought just wasn't going to work. <coughs> because what we were seeing was six inches of saltwater intrusion into the aquifer every day. Wow. We saw damage being caused to people's property uh, and, of course, into the environment. But unfortunately, the Division of Administrative Hearing Judge said that some harm was okay and that the districts had disc discretion in deciding what was sort of that level. Um, so as we see, you know, aquifers uh, dry up across the, across the state, folks are turning more and more to looking at alternative sources of water and our surface waters. And I'm sure you guys have heard a plan or two <laughs> of uh, folks who would like to take river water and move it from one area of the state to another. Mm -hmm. But our surface waters are also in danger. And the biggest threat to them is slime. Three million tons of fertilizer are applied in Florida every year. Wow. And I want you to think now of all the cows that we have in this state. They produce 125 pounds per day of manure each. <coughs> Add to that our 500 million gallons of sewage per day. And that's what you get. Massive algae outbreaks. What you're seeing here is a picture of the Caloosahatchee River. Uh, there's a lock that's dividing it and the green algal bloom is coming down from Lake Okeechobee. And this is what's sitting on one side of that lock. This is the Olga Water Treatment Plant. It serves 30,000 people, and it's been repeatedly shut down um, due to the toxic algae. So what causes algae outbreaks? They are caused by phosphorus and nitrogen pollution. And they come from a variety of sources, agriculture and livestock, runoff from our fertilized lawns, septic tanks, <coughs> urban runoff, uh, industry, sewage. And basically what happens is once you get excess nutrients, plants and algae just flourish. You know, it's like adding miracle grow in your garden. So everything goes crazy in the water. And uh, then you start to get algae blooms that stop the sunlight from getting through. And this is going to drop your oxygen levels in the water. Well, then the algae decompose, and then that further drops the, the oxygen levels. And then all of the stuff that's accumulating in the bottom, the decomposing plant matter, the continued influx of phosphorus and nitrogen, it starts to change your soil chemistry. And it can change your bacteria and what they're doing. And you can get to a point where the system actually <coughs> begins to release phosphorus back into the system. And even if you shut off the external source, it could feed itself. We see this in lakes in Florida. And it becomes almost like a pump, you know, it just sort of recirculates. And that's going to take years and years to fix if you can. Um, mm. Toxic algae is a growing problem in Florida. What you're looking at here is a picture from the Indian River Lagoon. I believe it was last year. They had this really weird brown algae outbreak. It, people described it as looking like chocolate milk. Um, and if any of you have been following the news this year, the Indian River Lagoon is really suffering. It's completely in breakdown. Um, there's been 100 manatee deaths in nine months. Uh, what they're saying is happening to the manatees is they basically are going into toxic shock and then they drown. So they become paralyzed and then they can't come up for air and they drown. And it's believed that they are eating algae that's growing on the sea grasses that they feed on. There's been 27 dolphin deaths since January 1st. The dolphins are turning up anemic, tumor ridden. There's been 250 to 300 brown pelican deaths since February. These birds are walking around basically like they're intoxicated, heads wobbling <coughs> side to side before they die. 
hundreds of dead redfish, sheepfish, and other fish. And we're still waiting for things to clear up. This is a fish kill that's a result of an algae balloon in Lake Munson that's outside of Tallahassee where I live. This is a DEP official or, or a worker testing Lake Munson. And I want you to pay attention to the gear he's wearing here. He's got plastic gloves on, he's got a big arm sleeve, a respirator. Unfortunately, when the public goes into uh, the outdoors and sees something like this, they don't have that equipment. They often don't even know they need it. But this is protocol for sampling and toxic algae. Oh, and you don't know it's toxic until you sample. Oh, and it doesn't always produce toxic results because it turns on and off. So what's toxic one day may not be the next, but it might be the next one. So this is a real public health threat. This is a stay out of the water posted on the Caloosahatchee River. Um, and this is not stuff you'd want to get into because it causes uh, a lot of different health effects in humans. One is rash. Um, this guy here, he actually was canoeing on the Little Wakaiba River. And he stopped to move a log out of the way and you know, brushed up against some, some algae. Um, he said it felt like his body was on fire, that all the parts of him that had touched this had not been covered in clothing, broke out of this terrible rash that looked like a burn. This was taken a couple weeks after it happened. He said it looked way worse. Um, also, you can have respiratory effects from breathing in those kind of, you know, algal toxins. And some people are more sensitive to that than other people. But it's something we see a lot of with the red tides that happen along the coast. You do see emergency room visits for respiratory problems spike during those episodes. And of course, it destroys property values. Uh, if you pay a lot of money for your million dollar house here, you know, you don't really want to look at that in your backyard. And when this stuff usually dies and decays, it smells pretty bad, too. It smells like rotten sewage. Where is that picture? This one, you would ask me that one. I think this one is, yeah, I want to say it's Jacksonville area. I can find it for you if we, once we get out. OK, and I just love this picture. This is red drip algae. Um, obviously, tourism is huge here, right? This algae is not a toxic algae but it piles up along our beaches and it costs thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to remove. You've got to get the bulldozer out there and, and get it out because it smells like sewage and it's not very attractive to the tourists. And we all know what it could mean if we stop getting tourists. This is a red tide blow in Tampa Bay. So <clears throat> what Florida had on the books uh, for its phosphorus and nitrogen standards was what's called a narrative standard. You can have two kinds of standards under the Clean Water Act. You can have a number, which we all know how to do that, or you can have sort of a narrative statement that you have to follow. Sometimes it's, you know, this water must be free from toxics. Sometimes it's something like that. Uh, in, in the case of nutrients, it was you couldn't add more uh, nutrient pollution then would cause an imbalance of flora and fauna. fauna. The problem is that how in the world do you know that until the water body has already flipped? You don't know you've reached the limit until you're at it. So basically, green water equaled a violation. Well, now it's already too late. So we believe that you need clear pollution limits, like speed limits. This is what it's safe to drive. This is what it's safe to put in this waterway so that maybe you could stop uh, a water body from flipping over into you know, a degraded status, that maybe you could keep it healthy uh, and usable by the people. So we dragged EPA to court. <laughs> and we said, you have an obligation under the Clean Water Act to set standards for Florida's waters for nit nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. And something surprising happened under the Bush administration. Uh, the then head of water at EPA 
um, basically agreed and said, you know, in Florida, you guys have a strange mix of uh, factors coming together. You've got slow moving water, sometimes it's shallow, it's really hot. You're really susceptible to algae blooms. And without having numbers, there's no way you can administer effectively a permit program. And so we think, you know, you do. You do, you do have to have numbers. And we agree with that. And then Secretary Mike Soul uh, said, yeah, they're, they're a great idea. So EPA and, and our clients settled the case. And everything was great. <laughs> the settlement uh, provided that if um, it, it will actually allow DEP first shot at making a rule. It said, they, they said they'd been working on one forever. So we said, okay, we'll give you 15 months to produce the rule that you've been working on for all these years that you keep telling us about. But if you don't do it, then EPA, you're obligated to step in. And that was the agreement. Um, <clears throat> DEP did come up with a rule in around 2009. It was a proposed rule. And it was pretty good. It was actually pretty reasonable which meant that the polluters didn't want them to implement it, and they never brought it to a final rule status. So EPA had to step in. <laughs> and they went ahead and basically took the, the, the framework of the 2009 rule, the rules were almost identical, and, and it adopted it. And it set pollution limits for dark lakes, and clear lakes, streams, springs, and, you know, some, some of the numbers were better than others, uh, but it had a provision that allowed if your specific water body didn't fit within the grouping or the region that was designated with the broad number, you could, you know, petition and have it show your science and have it either lowered or, or uh, heightened. Um, but the industries were not happy about this, and they decided that they were going to challenge the rules. Um, and they also challenged the underlying finding that these were even necessary, that EPA had made. And they went to federal court um, to do that. But in the meantime, they put on quite a public relations show. So they had a mock obituary they did for Florida's economy, because this was going to cost millions and billions of dollars. And there was no way we could ever afford clean water with these rules, is what they said. <coughs> they also claimed that there wasn't enough land space, and they'd be forced to tear down people's homes to build stormwater ponds. They stuffed utility bills with, um, with <laughs> notices that, their, that people's water bills were going to go up, their sewage treatment bills were going to go up $700 a year because they said they were going to need reverse osmosis for all their discharges. <laughs> they even tried, after they lost in federal court, <coughs> to get a rider out of Congress that would have stopped EPA from being allowed to spend money on enforcing the rules. So, now we had federal rules. But, Florida decided that, that they didn't want to let those stand, and they adopted their own set of nutrient rules, and they were incredibly complex. And the idea was, before the effective date of the EPA rules, if we can get our rules out there, EPA doesn't want to have to enforce every permit in Florida. They're going to let us pass this rule. So the rule was written by the polluters. And it was a very different rule this time. Instead of having numbers, it had just escape hatches. I mean, the whole thing is all about studies. That's what happens. You, you know, you get close to making a, a violation, they send you into study land. But see, this was part of the problem because, you know, under the, the old system, everything took forever. You never knew there was a problem until the river was green. And then you went through a TMDL process, which is an individual study. And then that takes forever. So now what they do is, well, 
You have to study each one to set the number. You know, every time there has to be uh, there has to be a connection. Almost never is the number alone just enough. So I decided <clears throat> that I would try to make sense of this rule, and uh, at my boss's urging, he said, you know, could you just make a flow chart or something so we can understand this thing. So, so I did. This is page one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. And what it comes down to is that no matter what your numbers are in a stream, in a river, like you all are care about on the swanee, if the bugs are good in the bug count that they do, then you can have as high of pollution limits as you do, it just it's fine as long as the bugs are good. The problem is that it's uncontested that those bugs and toxic algae can coexist. There's no correlation between a decrease in the bugs and uh, algae. So they're a poor metric to be protected in that in that uh, instance. They're all the critters along the bottom. How long did it take you to figure that out? Well, that's a, that's kind of an oversimplification. <laughs> but I mean, for streams, this is really this is um, there's a there's a million other parts of the of the rule, but mm -hmm. this really is sort of at the heart of it is it's numbers or bugs. It's one or the other. You violate the numbers. And the bugs are good. It's okay. And bugs have exoskeletons, so that's not the stuff is not as real creating rashes on them or whatever. Well, they don't seem affected by it. There's no connection. Another thing that um, that the DEP rule did was it excluded almost 75 percent of rivers, and it did this by saying <coughs> that um, streams that were altered and used for water management purposes were not covered by the rule. They still had the old narrative standard. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in Florida, um, think of all the places that have a weir on it. it there's a lot of places used, it, it, there's a lot of places altered. Mm -hmm. So um, this shuts out a lot of protections. So <coughs> weir like a bridge? <coughs> it's kind of like a, a mini dam. They're kind of like the little, you know. Oops. Control structure. Sorry. <laughs> Give me just a second. Okay. <clears throat> so we challenged DEP's rule in the Division of Administrative Hearings, which is a state administrative court. That's um, <clears throat> sort of part of the agency process. This is a, um, an advisory sign at Bannon Springs. Uh, just as an aside, one of our uh, one of our office workers um, had visited Fanning Springs with her children and her friend and her friend's children, and they all went swimming. And the little girl came out with a rash, um, which is what they're warning you of here. Of course, she reported that uh, to the park officials, but it never showed up in public records we looked at. And this is the, sort of the whole crew as we were in court. You can see there, there were a lot of people there. Uh, all the industry showed up. Unfortunately, though, the, the judge said that toxic algae is natural. And the rules stood up. And humans are temporary. <laughs> Making go swimming in it. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Put a glass on his desk and ask him to drink it. And EPA has really been getting, you know, a lot of pressure from the industry groups. So, unfortunately, they've basically agreed to approve Florida's rule. 
including the part that leaves out all of those rivers. They even plan to take back their determination. And then this session, the legislature, not surprisingly, uh, ratified the rule, turning the keys over to the polluters. This really raises the question of, is this the best we can do? I mean, these types of water body, this type of, of slime, is this really how Floridians want to live? That's Yellington Creek. That's China. I think we can do better than this. So the war goes on. And we're going to keep fighting. We'll be in court with our clients, the St. John's Riverkeeper, Sierra Club, Florida Wildlife Federation, uh, and the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. We've gotten together and formed a coalition, the Florida Water Coalition, which you see here. Um, and I urge you all to visit our website, uh, keep track of how things are developing. Because I do think that there's more that we can do in terms of Florida's water future. So, do I have some questions? I have a bunch. Okay. So if anybody else has any